All right, we're live. Welcome everybody. Okay, I think we are on live. So I'm just going to start talking instead of doing the usual. Can you hear me? Can you? Hear me? <laughs> so welcome to our first installment of the uh, book club for Ruth Markell's book, The Unveiling. Um, I have it. I know Judy has hers. Allison has her Kindle version there. So we're fired up and ready to go. Uh, welcome everybody. This is a really important topic to me and I know to most of you out there as well. Hi, Side Barbie, Tamara, um, Colleen, Irene, Pussycat, Jamie, uh, Mona, Mia. So um, you guys are here on my channel, so you know me. I think everybody knows me. Um, MJ, good, because you guys might want to read along. We're going to read passages and then we're going to discuss them. So hi, Raven, Rebecca. Um, so you may want to read along with your books and then and then please weigh in. Um, Ruth is not going to be present during this live stream. I talked to her today, but she'll I'm going to send her the link when it's over. Um, probably not a good venue to ask questions because she won't be able to answer them in this venue. But she asked me to kind of um, gather some questions, like maybe at the end, if you have any questions you want to put into the chat, and then she can think about them in another venue to answer those questions. So just FYI, but I'm hoping that people participate and um, share your thoughts and feelings as we go along. And um, because it's a very emotional book and it's a very important book to me. So as most of you know, um, you know, I've been following this case for years as well as probably most of you. Um, I attended Charlie Adelson's trial in Tallahassee, the entirety of that, and met uh, Ruth Markell there. And we've become friends since that time. I'm also a sister of a murder victim. So we have a lot of the same kind of interest in crusades, for lack of a better word, that's gonna come out in her book of um, kind of putting our tragedies into some sort of usefulness in the world. And so I really relate to Ruth and she's a brilliant human being and she's a brilliant writer and a beautiful person. So I really wanna um, highlight her today. And so I'd like for my guests to introduce themselves. Would Judy, would you like to start? Pretty much everybody knows sure. Judy. Sure, hi, <laughs> Judy, the YouTube vlogger here. Um, I'm an attorney in North Carolina and I had some mutual friends slash acquaintances with Dan Markell because my ex-husband is also a law professor. So I heard about this case pretty soon after it happened and just felt some sort of kinship with, with Wendy and Dan. And I've just really gotten into the case a lot more over the last couple of years by covering it on my YouTube channel. Please excuse my voice. I'm having some medical issues, so I'll try to get through it. Thank you for having me. Thanks, Judy. Thanks for being here. Okay, Allison, how about you? Um, well, Kathy, I first want to thank you for the opportunity to join the uh, book club and um, even more for sharing so much of yourself to create this supportive, uh, intelligent community. Uh, I really admire your courage and you've helped me feel less shame about the murder of my mom. And I also really appreciate the humor that you bring, uh, you know, to give some levity to such dark topics. Um, so I've been interested in the case since listening to the Wondery podcast. And um, I think particularly because it reminded me of my mom's murder by my father when I was five um, during their divorce process. Uh, professionally, I'm a professor at Yale. I'm um, the director of the Center for Infectious Disease Modeling uh, at the Yale School of Public Health. And um, I also hold an endowed chair in epidemiology there. And, and most importantly, um, I'm mom to three kids as well as three dogs. You don't look old enough to be a mom to three kids. <laughs> you look like a teenager. <laughs> well, welcome, Allison. Um, we're glad to have you here. Hang on one second. So Ruth asked me, we spoke on the phone today. It was sort of interesting because I, I reread this entire first section today. I read it 
when it very first came out and I went on a writing retreat because I'm working on my own book. And the very first thing I did on my writing retreat was to read her book cover to cover. And then I haven't read it since then. So this morning I sat down with it again to read this first section and boy, is it so well written and so emotional. And I called her right after that because I had some questions and she was just leaving a lunch with one of Dan's friends from Tallahassee who was there visiting in Toronto and she was headed to the cemetery. So, I mean, the timing couldn't have been more perfect of, you know, and she noted that actually. So that was pretty amazing. Um, so she asked that I start out by introducing her. So I'm going to put her on the screen. And there's our Ruth Mar Markell. And I'm going to read you what she sent me, um, which is kind of her, I think, kind of like a package about the book. And um, she asked that I start out the the group tonight with this. Ruth Markell is a noted author, public speaker, and the president of RNM Enterprises, a leading management consulting firm. She has worked in senior management positions in both private and public sectors for the past 40 years. Ruth has lectured on issues concerning negotiation and advancement in organizations at the University of Toronto, the London Business School, and Toronto Metropolitan University. Due to the circumstances surrounding the murder of Ruth's son's Dan Markell, she has appeared on 2020 ABC, Inside Edition, and Dateline NBC, and participated in the hit podcast Over My Dead Body by Wondery. She's done a lot more than that, too, since she wrote this up. Um, in 2016, Ruth was cut off from any contact with her grandsons. With support from Dan's friends, shout out to Tamara Demko, and extended networks, Ruth used advocacy to inspire the Florida State Legislature to pass a grandparent visitation bill known as the Markell Act. The bill opens a legal path for grandparents in the event of a surviving parent is found criminally and or civilly responsible for the death of the other parent while preserving the surviving parent's rights. Ruth hopes to use her platform and the media coverage that is inevitable around the trial and the publicity of Dan's case to make sense of, provides consolation and counsel for a horrific, powerless situation. And that her story will help others through the experiences of their grief from murders, victims of violence and grandparent alienation. And then she also has published other books um, one called Moving Up, A Woman's Guide to a Better Future at Work. Uh, one called Room at the Top, A Woman's Guide to Moving Up in Business. And then there's seven, six that are listed in foreign languages, in different languages. So um, that is a bit about her. And I'm going to post this whole package on, the, on um, my channel so you can go back and read it um, for yourself at another time. So let me go to comments and see if anybody has anything to share. Um, I have so much respect and admiration for Ruth. What a remarkable human, yes. Ruth is a powerhouse, just like her mother. Yes, her mother, that comes out in the book, doesn't it, Jamie? And just like her son, you can see where Dan gets that. Um, love that intro. Impressive. She's a very impressive person. And she's also a very unassuming person. So you kind of wouldn't necessarily know that she's that accomplished if you meet her because she's she's not like, you know, putting it out there aggressively or in any way. So like I said, we're going to go through today the first section of her book. And this first section, it's called part one. And it's called the title of the section is called Disbelief. And it has three chapters. The first chapter is the murder. The second chapter is Danny and Wendy. And the third chapter is grief. So we're going to read some excerpts and then hopefully talk about them and that you guys have comments and ideas and, um, you know, your own thoughts about how her book has affected you. She's a hum she is humble, which is another great trait. Absolutely. And she has so much discretion. This woman. Um, reading the book felt like a conversation. That's really um, a really good observation. Ruth writes in a way that made me feel like she's talking to the reader face to face. She's really great.
And somebody's showing Judy some love. <laughs> Trish Norman. All right. Well, speaking of Judy, let's let's kick this off with Judy. Sure. Uh, okay. I hope I can croak my way through this. Um, so this was actually from the introduction that really touched me. And it brought tears to my eyes as soon as I read it. So Ruth wrote, my son was never involved in any criminal activity, and he didn't engage in dangerous behaviors or live recklessly. Instead, Dan was an upright, thoughtful citizen. He was a devoted father and a loving son, a dedicated, revered law professor, a prolific, well-known scholar, and a wonderful uncle, brother, and friend. He lived a law-abiding and productive life dedicated to teaching and helping others. So, you know, just hearing her talk about her son just brings out so many emotions because you can imagine <coughs> this devastated mother having to talk about him in the past. So that's, that's what I wanted to point out from just the very, very first introduction. Okay, feel free to take Thank over. You, Judy. Sure. I don't know how I lost Allison here. Oh, no. Oh, there oh, she there is. She oh, is. I'm there. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, that Judy told me we were talking about doing this that when she read that. It brought tears to her eyes. Um, and it really hit her in the feelings that passage. And I think I had that experience all morning today. So I understand that. Let's see what people are saying. MJ, I cried when I read that too. That passage prompted me to think about that question. Why do bad things happen to good people? Life is so not fair. Yeah. <laughs> Life 3030, the reason why Jody always has a croaky throat is her years of playing Wendy in comedy skits. And she's a method actor taking on Wendy's laryngitis. <laughs> <laughs> or it's more like Donna. Donna has a screechy voice. Yeah. But didn't, what was Wendy? Wendy had laryngitis as an excuse for something at one point. Yeah, because she didn't want to talk to Dan. Oh, that's right. That week. Yeah. That's right. Let's see. Ruth's book was easy to read, so open and engaging. I felt like a visit with her sharing so many honest and personal details. Let's see. Raven says, I felt like I was sitting right next to Ruth. Hey, Jay, welcome. Jay, nice to see you. <laughs> Judy's Donna voice is priceless. <laughs> Well, you can do it too, Kathy. We have different, I have some sort of Boston accent mixed with like Minnesota. Mine is so bad. Well, hey, I'm from Georgia. What do I know what a Brooklyn <laughs> lady sounds like? The only thing I can get is domestic coordinator. Because yeah. <laughs> I'm literally. Domestic popular. coordinator. Yeah, there you go. I see I'm the proud mother for three children. <laughs> see, your domestic voice coordinator. <laughs> Oh, God. Okay, we shouldn't laugh. Somebody got yeah. on my case saying All I was right. bullying. So, okay. Brother. Sully, I've listened to the audiobook twice. Amazing. I haven't listened to it yet. I, I bought it to listen on my drive down to Tallahassee, and then I got caught up in other things. So I didn't, um, but I will, because I have another drive down to Tallahassee coming up. MJ, surrounded by friends and kind souls here. That's very nice. <laughs> There's Mona with the coffee. All right. Well, I'm going to read an, an, the um, the other. I think I'll go ahead and read the other thing that Ruth sent me because it does feel like kind of an entree into this um, experience here. So let me just pull that up if I'm I'm going to be looking at my screen in a different way. But she sent me this, which is an essay. It's three pages uh, that she wrote. It's it's some of these things are covered in the book, but she wanted this to be part of this. So I'm just going to read it verbatim. And I'm not quite sure what she wrote this for, if it was part of her preparation for writing the book or after, but I'm thinking with the timing, it's after when she wrote the book. But anyway, um, 
it doesn't matter. I'm going to read this. And it's titled Grief and About Dan. I have been grieving since my son, Dan Mark Hill, was killed eight years ago in 2014. He was murdered in cold blood outside of his home. He was 41. Over the past years, I've come to understand that you can't outrun your grief, nor does it ever really go away. Instead, it's something you learn to live with. For me, it continues all these years later. A long-term emotion I have accepted will never go away. It's part of who I am now, and I'm left with no other choice but to cope with the grief and find meaning. Boy, anybody can relate to that. Um, this experience grief, which we probably all have. Long before my son was killed, I learned firsthand about grief during my career as a social worker. I worked with and saw people who experienced extreme loss and tragedy. And I recognized that life could be unkind for all of us, no matter who you are and where you come from. I dedicated my life to helping people who were underserved by the system and understood how important it was to be supported, to have an advocate when you're so low, you can't find a way to advocate for yourself. When Dan died, however, I wasn't coming to grief as a professional, but as a victim. I've made it my personal mission to share my experience with others and attempt to help them feel less alone. I'm sure many of you um, are experiencing that. I'm not an expert by any means, but grief is one of those things you can't understand until you experience it yourself. Finding meaning after a loss, a tragic loss, is a common concern, but it takes a long time to get there. For most people who are grieving over the loss of a loved one, and it is many of us, it's important to first learn that you can't do it alone. Having a support network really helps. Finding a community, be it your religious institution, through therapy, volunteer, volunteer work, family and friends, or I'll say a YouTube channel, channels. Um, and I would imagine most of us are grieving the loss of someone, especially having just come through the other side of a global pandemic that took over a million lives, compounded by tragic and seemingly relentless mass shootings. I know many people are suffering and many have lost loved ones to violence. I know how vulnerable they are, what they're feeling, how lost and alone they can become. And perhaps most importantly, I know there is no easy solution. When I look at the news and see reports of mass violence and school shootings, I can't help but think about the mental health impact of this kind of extreme trauma. And yet as a society, we don't always know how to talk about it or how to understand it. From my own personal experience, I know how easy it is to get stuck in the grief experience. It can consume you, take over your entire life. I think it's important to acknowledge the grief, to acknowledge the momentous loss of someone important in your life, but there is also a time when you need to have enough reflection to see you must do something with your grief, to channel it outward in some way so you can find a way to keep living and redefine yourself. It's a very powerful sentence right there. After some time passes after the initial loss, most families who have lost a child want to do a ceremony or event, create a foundation, or find some public way to honor the loss. I encourage anyone grieving to start making steps in that direction, to take some kind of action, to remember there are still things under your control. This is why I travel to Tallahassee. At some point, you can self-reflect and acknowledge you'll never stop the grieving process, but you can give yourself permission to act in ways that accommodate your grief. After Dan died, here are the geese, <laughs> I started a fund for him at one of the Ontario Hillels, then planned an event at Harvard Hillel. I hope I'm saying that right. Dan, Dan's alma mater. There are steps toward action, efforts to memorialize your loved one in a meaningful way. I have found its best it's the best way toward preventing yourself from getting stuck in grief. It's also important to not just focus on the loss of the person, but to remember the life they lived before. Life has more meaning than death. And though it's hard when your loved one was killed in a violent act, it's important to remember they were more than just a victim. They were a person who had a full and important life that had meaning to the world and mattered to many people. Certainly true of Dan Markell. For me, it means remembering who Dan was before death, before murder was even a part of my vocabulary. Dan was a devoted son and father to his two boys, Benjamin and Lincoln. Dan loved music, dance, sports, and travel. He was a graduate of Harvard University where he studied politics and philosophy as an undergraduate, the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, and Emmanuel College in Cambridge where he earned a master's degree in political theory. And finally, 
Harvard College of Law, where he received his JD and began his impressive legal career. After graduating law school, Dan served as a law clerk for a federal circuit court judge before working as an assistant at a prestigious law firm in Washington, D.C. Okay, I just wanted to make sure something that I wasn't on mute. Um, where am I in Washington, D.C.? From there, Dan began what proved to be a successful career in academia, becoming a professor of law and landing a coveted teaching position at Florida State University College of Law. Dan's murder has not only deprived his large network and community of a dedicated and caring family member and friend, but it has also deprived the world of a brilliant attorney, teacher, and legal academic. He was a prolific scholar in the areas of criminal law and punishment and published a book on the intersection between criminal justice and family, numerous articles in the nation's leading law reviews, and opinion pieces for the New York Times, Slate, the Atlantic, and other publications. Dan's scholarship on retribution and criminal law and sentencing was highly influential and is still widely read and cited today. Dan also co-founded a blog, Prof's Blog, which focuses on a variety of topics related to law and life. Due to Dan's amazing dedication and tireless work, Prof's Blog continues to grow and inspire legal scholars and students around the world. I'm just going to interject to that because in our conversation this morning, she pointed out that he started Prof's Blog like before social media was really a thing. Like literally like the year before Facebook even became public, he was doing his profs blog. And because of that, they got so much outpouring of support internationally because people knew him so well from his blog because it was a social connecting device, his blog. Um, so she wanted me to, to point that out, that he was really a pioneer in the blogging world and particularly the legal blogging world. Mm -hmm. After losing Dan, I realized how important it is for those of us who are left behind to be able to become advocates for the person who is no longer around to advocate for themselves. This meant walking down a long path towards seeking justice to hold accountable the people who took my son from me. It was a path marred with many setbacks and roadblocks, including but not limited to the global pandemic. As we sought justice, as the case went to court, there was some feeling of hope in finding and convicting the people who had committed such a horrible act. And yet it's difficult to describe the experience of being forced to relive the trauma of Dan's death through the ongoing criminal justice process and trials. It was an experience of getting what we wanted, momentum in the case strides toward justice, and yet it meant always going back to the scene of the crime, the last moments of Dan's life, and each time there was nothing I could do to stop it. Our family wanted, waited more than five years and lived through countless media stories before the people, Sigfredo Garcia, Catherine McBanawa, Luis Rivera, involved in Dan's murder were brought to justice. What can I say? I didn't know it before, but I know it now. Justice takes time, a lot of time, more than I ever realized. In 2022, Catherine was unanimously convicted of first degree murder, conspiracy to commit murder and solicitation of murder. And Charlie Adelson was arrested on April 21st, 2022. And as we all know, he was convicted on my birthday, 2023, November, November 6th. The quest, is, the quest for justice after tragic loss, the waiting for answers that comes with accountability by means of the criminal justice system only exacerbated the pain, grief, anxiety I was experiencing. When you lose a child to violence, it's the starting point of a major and permanent trauma that changes shape over time but never goes away. I have a very strong bond to the shock effect on other families, particularly mothers who have lost children to violence. Facing law enforcement, trials, media coverage, the justice system, even the murder itself, seeing the murderers at the trial becomes the reality and routines of everyday life. This kind of impact and change that so many face is an important conversation I want to start having. It's one of the many reasons I wrote my book, The Unveiling, A Mother's Reflection on Murder, Grief, and the Trial Life. Dealing with the murder of a loved one is a life sentence, and no one can do it alone. Although this is my 10th book, wow, our 10th book, it's like no other that I've ever written. The shock of losing my son is a very painful story compared to writing business and management books. The unveiling has allowed me the opportunity to share my experience as a homicide victim and to also share the weight of the journey of my son Dan's murder. Living the trial life has not been heard or valued in the criminal justice system. 
I am ready to be the storyteller of the victim's suffering and hope for guilty verdicts for the offenders. I'm truly grateful to our family, friends, dance friends, coaches, colleagues, medical advisors, and clergy who have traveled this painful journey with me and have shared my roller coaster experience. Their support needs a dedication book of gratitude to acknowledge their contributions. My list of people I'm grateful for is endless and expands every day. Gratitude has become a buzzword in pop psychology, but it's a very real feeling for me. I am grateful to my family and friends who have kept me standing in this period of waiting when I was still preoccupied with the harshest part of my grief. This collective network has been the key to helping my family remain involved, informed, motivated, and hopeful. I have been privileged as these relationships have taught me to see the world's compassion. Giving a voice is no guarantee, but writing a book starts the conversation. So let's have the conversation. No, this is not in the book. This is an, uh, an essay that she sent me. And um, let's just put uh, Ruth on the screen. This was a uh, separate essay that she wrote. So uh, that was very emotional. These are some of the comments. All right. Dan, Daniel Eric Markell, so special in so many ways. Yeah, we're going to get to know him a little bit better when we go along. Yeah, I love that his blog has continued on. He really was prescient. Prescient, yes. Me too. You can feel the love he had for his sons and his posts. Judy, have you read uh, much of his blog? Uh, yes. Sometimes I just stumbled on his posts when I was Googling, <clears throat> for example, trying to find the post about um, how happy he was when he got engaged to Wendy. He said something about how he felt like he won the lottery because Wendy agreed to marry him. And then there was a post about how happy he was when his older, oldest son was born. And, you know, it, it's just so sad reading it. So you know, personal. What happened. Yes. Let's see. I thought it was a discussion of the unveiling. It is a discussion of the unveiling. Ruth Markell, who wrote the unveiling, sent me that essay and wanted me to read that as part of this discussion because she said that relates to this section of the book that we are talking about today. That wasn't a script. That was a, an essay written by Ruth Markell that relates to the book. Her thoughts on grief are so profound. People are grieving are expected to just move on and be normal. Her words are so helpful to those of us who are grieving who want a life worth living. Yeah, that, I mean, you know, it's her words are one thing, but it's truly her actions and it's how she's living her life. Top Cat says, Ruth's words about grief are so helpful to me and I'm sure to many others as well. There's something about it that's just giving, giving the permission, you know, I mean, the survivor guilt is a very real thing. And Allison, I don't know if that's something you've dealt with in your life. Oh yeah, definitely. So, I mean, it's like sometimes just hearing somebody that you know has lived through it, giving you the permission to have your life, you know, that it's okay to have your life. That's not destroyed by this is um, very impactful. And that's something that I took from that too. That was so moving. I'm about to cry. Yeah. Let's see. Wow. Amazing. Powerful words by Ruth. Love and hugs to all the Mark Hale family, especially to his sons, sons Lincoln and Ben. Ben. Yes, Judy, so correct. He was so well intended with his new family, with his wife and sons. What happened to him was so wicked. We all love you, Ruth. 
Life 3030 says, Ruth reminds me of my own mom who died almost 15 years ago. My mom was a writer and she inspired my creative side. I'm sure Ruth was a ma major influence on Dan and all he achieved. Love you, Ruth. Yeah, that really comes through in the book, um, how close they were and how much they talked, you know, how regularly they talked, especially when he was going through the divorce and how much he leaned on her. Um, and you can really see the way he's described is clearly very influenced by her. Tia says, Dan lives on even larger than in life, if that's possible, through Ruth and her words and memories, such a juxtaposition of pain and beauty felt simultaneously. Wow, that is really beautiful, Tia. Yeah, I mean, we can avoid all of that, but, you know, it's there. <laughs> it is there. Shannon says, you are a superior writer, Ruth. What a spectacular son, father, brother, Dan was. What a spectacular mom. Good wins out. Your love is contagious. That's a beautiful sentiment. Ruth's grief is complicated. She explained that so well. Yes, she does talk about that in the book. Judy says, Ruth is an amazing writer, like mother, like son. Yeah, he was definitely really really good with words. Raven says, Ruth is giving us all a class on how to handle grief in the best way possible. Yeah. I'm not one to easily cry, but I cried when I read the first section of Ruth's book. Ruth is such an eloquent writer. The essay was a great addition. I think so too. She didn't just lose one person, she lost her grandsons and has to deal with more than one murderer. Yeah, I mean, it's just endless, these trials. Ruth is human being goals. Ruth is an exceptional human being. Edie says, grief never heals. Grief is like a weather storm. Some days it might be a light rain and the next day it can be a tsunami. That's truth, true, Edie. Um, and, you know, Allison has been dealing her whole life with deep grief and violent death. Um, and I've been dealing my whole life with grief as well. And I don't know, Allison, if you want to weigh in on this, but, you know, it's really true that some days, you, you know, you can feel like you're way far beyond things. And then you can hear a song or have an image or something happens. And then suddenly you're like right back there again, like it just happened. I mean, do you experience that? Uh, yeah, definitely. I mean, even when I was a kid, when, I, you know, after my mother's murder, I felt numb. Um, and it wasn't until I became a mother myself that, uh, I, I felt, I think that's almost when the grieving process started for me because, um, you know, I knew how much I loved my baby and um, just thinking of how much she loved me um, and also how my children were going to miss out on, you know, her as a grandmother. And um, I didn't, I, you know, I didn't have her advice uh, as a new mom. That was all really hard. And, and, you know, I was also in, and this is, I wouldn't be surprised if um, Dan's boys uh, are in this uh, denial is a really powerful thing. And, um, you know, I didn't want to, despite seeing my, uh, father violent with my mother, um, smother my mother, um, despite knowing that he had arranged for me to be at his uncle's house the night she was strangled. Um, and despite knowing he has uh, a violent temper it was directed at me, I still didn't want to believe and couldn't believe that he was guilty um, for more than two decades after her murder. Wow. That sounds like we could do a whole show on that sometime, Allison, because I think that would be really helpful to for people to have a you know, to peer into perhaps what Dan's children, I call them Dan's children, um, have experienced and are experiencing. And, 
and maybe some hope that they will, you know, come out of that denial that you talked about. Cause it's, it's, um, it's a big crusade of Ruth's is that, you know, she's always saying that on the forefront is keeping the boys, this lighting is kind of crazy in, um, in the forefront of her life in her mind and, you know, ask us to do that too. So maybe we can delve into that another time. Judy, how do you feel about reading a little bit more or you, uh, you don't I want can to read a few sentences. Sure. I had um, another paragraph, which is the last, since you were on the introduction, which is the yes. very last paragraph of the introduction, starting with okay. in addition to telling my and my family story. I had that earmark to read. So. Sure. Okay. Let me try. Okay. <laughs> in addition to telling my and my family story, I will write about my experience of the trial life to dispense any wisdom and insights I have gleaned along the way and to emphasize how people can show support and offer empathy to others left bereft, helping living victims of violent crimes or indeed anyone navigating the trials of life, including trauma of any kind, is a cherished goal of mine. I want to make sure that other grandparents do not find themselves in the same situation as I and Dan's father are, grieving the loss of contact with grandchildren. Okay. Do you want to go ahead? You read so much better than I do. I can pick it up there. Okay, um, go ahead. <laughs> I and Dan's father are grieving the loss of contact with, grand, with grandchildren. I want to inspire people to find a purpose in their lives and to use their grief and loss, however they show up in whatever context to make a real difference. I'm going to read that sentence again, because I want us all to hear that, <laughs> because this is like a mandate from Ruth Markell, as far as I'm concerned. I want to inspire people to find a purpose in their lives and to use their grief and loss, however they show up in whatever context to make a real difference. Let's just take that in for a minute. And I want everybody that's in this chat and in this watching this show and on this screen to take that in and feel like just showing up to this here, just reading Ruth's book and taking it in and showing up and talking about it and sharing is fulfilling that I think is that however they show up and everyone is showing up today. So I just want to just take a breath and like feel that about ourselves that we are doing that we are showing up and um, that right now in this moment, that's enough. Most importantly, I want to guarantee that Dan is never forgotten by his children or family, the legal community and the world at large. He contributed so much during his far too short time on earth. Continuing to contribute even after his death would be very much in character for Daniel Eric Markell. So I know many people I've, you know, participated in a lot of other shows. I mean, watched a lot of other YouTube shows and stuff. And there's a lot of people that comment on how Dan Markell in death has um, affected their life. So myself included. So let me see some of these comments. That says so much. And that is what Dan would want. That's right. And it's really honoring him and, and it's feeding Ruth and supporting the family too. I've often found joy in the stories shared at a funeral about a friend or family member that's passed away. They can be funny and inspiring. This has helped me in the grieving process. Allison, did you want to give your last name or somebody asked your last name? Oh, oh sure. Allison Galvani. Galvani is her last name. We're going to have Allison on again if she wants to. And so we can talk more about her story. And what yeah, her life has been. Yeah, that would be great. Dan seemed like the kind of man who always put others first. That's right, Colleen. He's affected all of our lives and brought us all together here as well. You know, I've really thought about that. Like, why this case? You know, why has this case gotten so much interest, so much attention? And I think it really just boils down to Dan Markell, the victim, you know, because usually it's women. You know, usually it's women murder victims, you know, Lacey Peterson. Oh. You know, they, they get that kind of attention, worldwide attention. But this one has really, really, you know, and I think it really is the um, the victim. 
Who's the lady? I didn't know what. This is um, Allison, who's here. Sue Klebold's book. I did not read that one. I have not read that one. To myself, it seems that Ruth has helped her grief by acknowledging and accepting both positive and negative feelings and allowing herself as much time as she needs to experience thoughts and feelings. That's really good, Sully. Yeah. I would agree with that. Just being with, because I mean, she has been on a roller coaster, you know, for what is it? 10 years now, a full decade. Debbie, I'm going to ask you to just scroll back and, um, and see Deb, uh, Allison's introduction. She's a, a member of our community. <laughs> My dog is looking around the house for Allison's dog. It's the worldwide connection we all have in trying to understand good versus evil. Yeah, that is a big part of this, isn't it? You know, there's that drive because there's so much evil in this case, and it just seems endless, the evil. Um, that it is, it is perplexing. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna move on into this next portion. Now, there's so much of this book, but I just earmarked some things that really um, stuck, stuck out to me. And we are into the chapter called the murder. So, you know, Ruth found out about it when she was with her uncle laser, who was really a surrogate father to her because she lost her father young, like Allison, like me, you know, losing a parent very young. And, um, so he became a surrogate father to her and she was with him when she got the call. So this is around that time. Um, and he died only a few months after Dan died. Yeah, like, I think like, yeah, three or four months after. And she, I mean, he was an elderly man, but she th that said that the, the um, impact of this just, yeah, he just didn't recover from it. Um, Phil told me, so Phil was not with her. He was in Colorado. When, when he got the call first and they had a hard time getting hold of them because Wendy sure, certainly wasn't helping. Um, Phil told me that the police had had a hard time finding us and only reached him by looking him up on Facebook. I mean, there's Wendy sitting for six hours being interviewed and they have to search on Facebook to find Dan's parents. It's disgusting. Yeah, she could have helped more. Yeah, it's like she, didn't she could have prioritized that. I mean, what else is a priority than that? You yeah. know, instead of, you know, let's see how many people we can throw under the bus and throw out there and talk about jokes and all that. Talk kind about of her blue eyes. It really speaks to her motivation, doesn't it? You know, at the time that her motivation was to fish for as much information, to drop as many distractions into the thing, but not a normal motivation that somebody would have of like, we need to let people know I need to be with my kids. Yeah. You know, she was so into obfuscating the whole thing. Anyway. Yeah. Um, the friend Phil was staying with in Colorado was a doctor who told Phil right away that there was no chance if dad, that Dan would make it after sustaining that kind of injury. If Dan survived, he would be a vegetable, a shooting, a vegetable. Hearing those words made me think my whole world was turning upside down. Chris came back into the kitchen. She had left while Phil and I were speaking. I don't know what my face looked like, but it must have been clear to her that something was terribly wrong. Dinner was ready on the dining room table and the Shabbat candles lit. They had just started their Shabbat dinner. Just as if it were a normal night, I left the kitchen and walked over to my uncle who was sitting at the dining room table. At that moment, my task was one of the hardest things I ever had to do in my life. I had no idea how many more hard things I would soon have to do. I sat beside Laser, put my hand on his shoulder and leaned forward. Laser, I said, it's Danny. Danny's been shot in the head. I couldn't bring myself to tell him that Danny was going to die. Uncle Laser stared at me, taking in the news. He didn't say anything at first. Then he raised his fist slowly and slammed it on the table, laying it with an intensity that continues to burden my life in the most previously unimaginable ways to this very day. It was with the force of a younger and very angry man and a message that shook me. Makatumnim. Laser said in Yiddish, Makatunim, the in laws, the in laws. <sighs> wow. I mean, I got the chills and everything. 
<sighs> Any thoughts on that, ladies? Yeah, full body chills. Yeah. It's so sad that this man lived to be 97 years old, and it was his birthday, and this had to happen on his birthday. No, it's, oh, it's so sad. I missed that that was his birthday, Judy. Yeah, they celebrated his birthday. Dan called him to say happy birthday that morning. Um, yeah, yeah um, Dan had, they'd called Dan, um, yeah, just that morning. And so the um, that uncle would have spoken to Dan just, you know, hours before. Shot maybe just an hour. Yes, and she talks about um, in the book about how she was on the phone with Dan, you know, right before this happened, because they were as he was driving home, like they often did. He often called her when he was driving home, and then he, the other call came in from that teacher, and so he's like his last words to her was like, "Ma, I gotta go. I'll call you back," and and how you know, she was projecting how she would have felt if she had stayed on the phone with him when it happened and had heard those sounds and, you know, literally been right next to him in the, in the car on the phone. Um, anyway, that was a lot. What a wise and insightful. Oh, I don't know what that is. Ruth is a gift to us of bravery, strength, class, and compassion, born of pain and loss. Yeah. Um, I think his intuition is really impressive. It's also really tragic to me that he he must have realized the evil um, and narcissism uh, and hate that the in-laws had, you know, it just indicates how uh, terrible their behavior had been to Dan leading up to that. Because otherwise the uncle wouldn't have immediately thought of them as the culprits. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I wonder if Dan had been talking to him about all the things that were going on, you know, at that time and all the legal things that were happening. And I wonder if he had confided in him about yeah. those things. Ironically, it was Wendy's duplicitous scheme with the school that saved Ruth Markell from being on the phone with Dan when he was shot. That's true, because she was setting that whole situation up, and the timing of that threaded that needle. Mary Crone and Judy, I've loved your sensitive coverage of this case since day one. Thank oh, well, thank you, I Judy. I don't Mary, know. Come on. Maybe I should. Maybe I should lay off the comedy. Some people have have sent me messages complaining and telling me I was being so mean to the eight whole sons and acting like a bully and unprofessional. So I don't oh. know. No, no, absolutely not. I think um, uh, I think that's very appropriate humor, you know. Uh, so yeah, I do too. I don't think yeah. And I mean, it's YouTube. There's plenty of people that have something to say. And it's like, go make your own channel and do it your own way. I mean, <sighs> not every channel I mean, has to be 100% serious. Yeah. I wouldn't be surprised if the Adelsons have like a PR company that sends those kinds of messages, you know, as, as bots, basically. Yeah, somebody else has said that, too, that they are out there kind of doing little PR things. Um, mm -hmm. I can't imagine hearing your child being murdered and be thousands and thousands of miles away, powerless, terrible. But, but see, that's what, that's why today when I reread that paragraph, I started thinking, well, geez, if Wendy had worked harder to try to track down Ruth and Phil, maybe Dan's parents could have been there at the hospital before he passed away. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't know for sure, but when we watch her interrogation, she just made it sound like she didn't have their phone numbers. So yeah, I think that oh was well. really disingenuous. I, I yeah. think that she was afraid that they would 
immediately suspect her and mention that to the police. And so she wanted to delay getting them involved. Yeah, yeah I mean, been. she had a different, clearly a different agenda, which was she went into it with that agenda was to throw suspicion in all kinds of different directions and off herself. And, um, you know, probably the same motivation that got her to cruise down Trescott, nosy, trying to figure out what's going on, trying to sit there long enough to glean information. Yeah, that, that was that's that's so weird to me. Uh, I I agree that it definitely indicates her guilt and knowing, but that was such a stupid thing to do. Um, like, and she would have she knew she would know for sure within a matter of hours. So was she just impatient to see it? Uh, that's I, right. I, Someone had to confirm it was done. So yeah. That, Hitman would get paid. It seems like, though, I mean, I don't know, but I, I listened to um, there was a recent release of a portion of a jail call from Charlie to Donna shortly after he was convicted, where he's going on and on and on about the Trescott drive. Did you guys hear that? Like, yeah. like as if that was the thing that convicted him. And it really led me to think that that maybe was not part of their plan you know, as a group that she right. might have gone rogue with that. Yeah. Yeah. I think she went rogue with that. Yeah. yeah and Charlie's resentful. Like he's like, you yeah. know, <laughs> such a stupid thing to do. Yeah. yeah. Why does she do that? And she what's interesting is herself. Donna is silent through most of that when he's venting about that, because, you know, that puts her in a very awkward, what, what side is she going to take? Because it's, he's sort of insinuating that Wendy's drive to Trescott is what put him, put him where he is. So yeah. And also suggest that she, that Wendy didn't feel even partly guilty or uncomfortable about what was happening because like she wanted to see it for herself. It's it's Yeah. Like she clearly intentionally wanted to go down there. Yeah. But, yeah. Yeah. Um here's a very thoughtful comment. Um I think laser was hidden by a family during the Holocaust. So he knew evil very well. Oh yeah, that's right. And didn't the ring come through him? Yes. The ring that yeah. When he gave back the Holocaust ring. Mm -hmm. That was his ring that he had bought for his wife. I assume. Yeah. I would assume that too. Wonder yeah. where that thing is. Let's just hold, hold the high watch that that's going to come back. All right. Well, let's move forward. Um, let me see. Where am I? Okay. At two I at two a.m., the hospital called to say that Dan had passed away. The gunshot wounds were too severe for him to have any chance of recovery, and the hemorrhaging in his brain had proven fatal. I couldn't think or feel anything. I was frozen. I started packing to leave on the first flight out. Before being picked up at 6 a.m., I woke up my uncle to tell him that Dan was dead. Laser started shaking and crying uncontrollably. Call me from Florida, he said, tears flooding his eyes. I wish I could be there. As I looked at his stricken face, I realized that I still hadn't cried. The sight of Laser shivering like that was awful. It has stayed with me ever since, and I will never get over it. This was the beginning of his undoing. I would soon lose my surrogate father, Laser, and my son within three months. More devastation would enter my world. <sighs> Do you have your book, Allison, or you, you got your Kindle? Sorry, I, have, I was on mute in case the dogs made noise again. Um, I, I have the Kindle. I do have the book in the other room. If you want to read a little bit more, because I actually have a lot of things kind of dog-eared. And so, you know, if you want to jump in and read some other things too, I mean, it's totally your call. Uh, sure, I can sure, keep sure, reading I, too. Um, so, yeah, I was, I was planning to focus on Ruth's explanation about how her grief didn't conform to the famous um, Kubler-Ross model. Mm -hmm. um, Okay, so, well, let's wait till we get to that then, because oh, we'll okay. stay on the chapter of the murder, and I'll just keep reading. Um, okay. Yeah, thankful for the friends and family that stayed with him so he wasn't alone in the hospital. Yes, it is heartbreaking. I think I'm going to put, 
let me put, um, where are my other pictures? Hang on. I have some other pictures that she sent me. One second. Huh, I don't know why those didn't make it up here. Well, because she sent me some pictures of the boys. I don't know why those disappeared. I wonder if sometimes if I add too many things, they delete other things. I'm still getting used to this system. Anyway, here is another picture of Ruth at her book signing. So let's put that up there. That's when I met her. That's the night that I met her. And that was at Dan's synagogue. And I met her right at that place when she was signing books. So let's have her up there while we're reading. Okay. Um, this is at the point when they were, she was there, they were dealing with the police. These were things that no parent should ever have to hear when they were describing the um, injuries. Years later, when it came to watching the visual depictions during the trial, I would be unable to remain in the courtroom to see the criminal evidence. For now, they asked us a lot of questions, took notes, recorded us, and listened to every word we said. I was able to give my answers in a relatively calm tone because I still had not fully accepted that Dan was dead. I wasn't in shock. I was in an out-of-body experience. I hadn't descended into proper, proper grief yet. Other people might have been in hysterics, but I was experiencing a strange reaction. I just answered the questions, teary-eyed, but I was able to respond as if it was also rational, as if these questions were like any other questions. People would ask me questions about Dan all the time, so I was used to talking to him about him, but not with the police. I always remembered the description of the bullet in his head, but I never wanted to see the crime pictures. I relate to a lot of that. I never have seen any of the pictures of my sister, except for one time totally by accident. Um, and um, it's extremely traumatic. And uh, I had to sort of force that, associate myself from that image. I left the courtroom too when those images were shown like Ruth does. Um, and I relate also to the being able to talk very, like being with the police and talking very rationally and not having any emotions and just information, 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 just giving them tons of information. I definitely was like that. And I think that's interesting that she says she wasn't in shock. It, she, she was in an out of body experience. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if anybody um, has experienced that. Yeah, I, I experienced that um, uh, when uh, even, even like the first day when um, I was interviewed by the police when I was five, um, I just felt numb and yeah, kind of almost like I was dissociating from my body looking down. Mm -hmm. You remember that feeling? Yeah. That's really interesting that that stayed with you. Yes, I will give, I'm sorry about that, you guys. I will give you the um, page number so you can read along. Um. Did anyone else notice how fixated, speaking about the, um, the crime scene photos, Charlie was, in when he was talking to Donna on the phone calls after he was convicted, he was, he, he was so aghast at, at, at the prosecutor putting up the photos um, in her closing statement, and that they were horrible photos. <laughs> um, uh, but that's what he did, you know, that that's, mm -hmm. that was his objective to, to cause that, uh, that violence and, you know, homicide to, to Dan. Yeah. Sorry. We don't, you know, you don't get to have that sanitized in a murder trial, you know, and he was so offended by that. I tell you what really offended me was rash bombs response to that. Because, you know, I was there in person and I watched him every single time they put those pictures up there. He physically pivoted his chair away from the screens and looked down as if he was sort of offended of having to be subjected to that. And I'm like, Dan's loved ones are in this courtroom and you're acting offended that you have to look at this murder victim. Like I, I found his, his reaction so 
personally offensive that he was he was acting like this was some sort of you know offense to him instead of just sitting there stoically and like yeah this really happened guess what rash bomb that really happened you know that's not anything who's faking it is your client but i mean it, i i just was mm -hmm. so put off by that that was sort of the beginning of my end of um having any respect for daniel Rashbaum. Yeah, very offensive. Rashbaum's reaction was a planned response just for the drama of it. Interesting. You don't think he looked offended? You think he looked disturbed by the picture? I don't know. It's hard, it hard to read him, but it was just the way that he just sort of so dramatically looked away. It just was really, um, really offensive to me. Like, you know, that's your job. That's part of your job, Rashbaum. You got to deal with this. This is a very ugly situation that you put yourself right in the middle of. So that's part of it. I don't know. It, it, it also did seem to be, he was so inappropriate. Anyway, I don't want to go down that road today. we we'll stayed back on the book. So mm -hmm. moving forward, the place where they had the first, that service that they had after, um, you know, right away was at the same synagogue that I went to when I was in Tallahassee because Ruth did that book event. I don't know how she disappeared from this thing, but where she did this book event right here, I was there. So I was at, it was very, very, um, very emotional for me. But anyway, to be at Dan's synagogue where he was, you know, it was such a huge part of his life. And that's where they had that, um, service is a memorial service. And she wanted me to be clear that that was a memorial service and the funeral was in Toronto. But the, what they went to initially was a memorial service, the one where Wendy sat in the back with Donna and the boys. And it was so disorienting to um, Ruth. So yeah, I've been in that um, synagogue. The synagogue had folding chairs covering every square inch of available space. More than 200 people came from all over Florida. Along with other congregants, Sam Kimmelman, that's really funny, I highlighted that because that's who she had lunch with today, um, organized the speakers, the prayer order, and the hymns. I caught a glimpse of Wendy and her family in the back of the shul with four-year-old Benjamin standing near her family and three-year-old Lincoln in her arms. I couldn't wait to get close to them. It felt awkward that they were not in the front. We're going to show you a piece of art that Mia Wallace made and sent me today that is inspired by this whole scene. Um, and she's talking more about that service. And then I had been... I had barely been able to articulate more than a few sentences in the past two days, yet something was nagging at me. I wanted to use the moment to tell the boys what their father would have wanted for his sons. I motioned for Wendy to come forward. She brought Lincoln to the stage while Benjamin stayed at the back with his grandparents, Donna and Harvey. It's disgusting. Like, who stays at the back? And it's their father. Um, it's it just... Just that visual is so descriptive of the entire deal with them. When I spoke, it was directly to the boys. Benjamin, Lincoln, your father loved you both so much, and he wanted more than anything for you to have Jewish roots, understanding the tradition of Shabbat and holidays, and to be close to your family. Then I went in a different direction and spoke to everyone. My five grandchildren meant everything to me. I'm sorry. I meant to tell you. It's on. This is page 15. I'm sorry. I didn't do that again. Anyway, um, then I went in a different direction and spoke to everyone. My five grandchildren mean everything to me. But when any of them ask me to buy them pretend guns or other police toys, I say, no, we don't play with gun those kinds of things. We come from Canada and we don't encourage guns as gifts. We know that guns are dangerous, that terrible accidents can happen with them and that they should not be used for problem solving. I couldn't help myself. Wendy stood holding Lincoln, listened until I was finished, then carried him back to her family. She didn't say anything. Yeah, Ruth's writing is so easily visualized. It is. With Ruth's writing, I feel like I'm there. Me too. Yeah, um, the grandparent alienation began at the freaking memorial. It did. 
them taking control and, um, and, and separating them, you know, taking, you know, putting them in their bubble and separating them from their father, <laughs> you know, literally separating them from their father. Like they're right by the door, ready to make, hightail it out of there. And Wendy didn't even allow the grandparents to see the boys the day after. Right. Yeah. We're, and we're getting to that too. And a lot of people know that part of the story, but, um, but we're still going to go over it because it's a big part of it. It's a big part of what Ruth went through. And, you know, she's, this is her experience. It's good that Ruth had no idea how much the Adelsons truly hated Dan. She was so naive to their schemes. Yeah. Yeah. She was. Um, and it, I relate to that. You are naive until you're not. Mm -hmm. yeah, this part about Donna walking up to Ruth crying uncontrollably, that just brings to mind what people have told me about Donna and how two-faced she has been throughout her life, that she's the type of person who will just smile, laugh, you know, just look normal while totally lying to your face. These are people who actually knew her. Wow. So she's a devious person. From she is. And, you know, we see that too. And like what she's writing privately to these emails and then rash bomb going on surviving their survivors saying she's the most polite person he's ever met. Yeah. So kind. Yeah. Like his mom. Yeah. God. Yeah. Mommy issues. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sounds like Wendy learned from the best. Um, so anyway, continuing on in Tallahassee, the detectives, detectives led us from the crowd in front of the synagogue because you got to remember they're in this place where they have no idea what happened and there's got to be some feeling of like are they in danger you know like I mean in going to Dan's house is, is you know the whole place must have felt you know this grief I mean I relate to that too this grief on top of um, feeling unsafe you know and anyway it's just so as somebody said earlier complicated in Tallahassee, okay, we're on 16 now, guys. I'm going to remember that now. We're on page 16 toward the bottom. In Tallahassee, the detectives led us from the crowd in front of the synagogue to an unmarked police car so they could drive, drive us over to Dan's house for more questioning. So they were questioning them in Dan's house. I felt actual terror at the thought of being inside my son's home and of looking through his belongings and that he was not there. Even worse, he was not coming back. I was not ready for this reality. On the way, Detective Isom and his team were honing in on specifics. Did Danny have a will? Isom asked, turning to faces from the front seat. We did a thorough search through the house and found a life insurance policy, but no will and testament. Any idea where it is? He explained that one of the threads they were pursuing was, quote, the money. I knew that Danny didn't have any gambling issues or loan sharks coming after him. So I wasn't sure what quote the money meant Then even in my stupor, I said, I know where to look. And she's talking about how she and Dan had gone over some papers. She had brought some papers down and she knew where he put them. It was kind of funny how she described him as having orderly piles. Um, Cause they say you're either a piler or a filer. <laughs> it sounds like he was a piler. I'm a piler. And so she kind of knew where to look, but she also knew like, I can't do it today. And um, just said, this is going to have to be another day. Like, I mean, that, that just had to be so incredibly overwhelming. Dan's house was on Trescott drive in the tree line, Benton Hills neighborhood mm -hmm. of Tallahassee, which we all know about. As our police car turned the corner, I saw Dan's house for the first time. I'm over on 17 now, by the way. Um, it immediately looked different to me. I saw Dan's house for the first time since the killing. It immediately looked different to me. This home that had been filled with so much love and life was now dreadful with tragedy. The police pulled into the driveway. Dan's house was a contemporary split level decorated in a style I would joke with him about and describe it as early 21st century preschool. Um, Dan had designed the entire first floor with its huge open plan kitchen living room to be supremely child friendly for Benjamin and Lincoln. Dan didn't just have toys and games for them. He had attached a long clothesline across the entire ceiling from which he hung all the boys artwork. It was so touching. Walking up to the front door, the banner was at the front of my mind with seeing the row of crayon drawings and finger paintings lovingly displayed make me break down. 
As we opened the front door and walked in, I took a quick, harsh intake of breath. I did not collapse, but in truth, it felt even worse than I had imagined. My soul was screaming, why isn't he here? And I felt the indescribable sadness of knowing my son had breathed between these walls just days before. What had Dan touched before he left the house on Friday? Could I find anything still warm from his fingertips? <sighs> That's really... I looked up and saw the clothesline filled with the boys' drawings and collages. You could even see the Lego construction. Would Danny want people going through his papers? I mean, all of that was, I think, just too much. And she, they looked for his um, precious Jewish symbolic items that he used in prayer and um, prayer shawls and, and things like that, that um, they were going to bury him in. Like, I mean, that, um, that's what they were looking for, but like papers and stuff like that. It was just uh, a bridge too far. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, let's breathe for a second. This is so heartbreaking. I mean, she's taking you right into the moment. <sighs> the unveiling should be required reading for everyone speaking out about this case. It's true. Yes, definitely. I feel like buying copies for people who can't afford to buy their own copy. So mm -hmm. maybe I'll put something on my on my channel. Community I'll ask page. her if she's um, going to be bringing some down. Cause you know, she did last time, Judy, remember that she brought mm -hmm. a bunch of copies. I'll ask her cause then we could get autographed copies. Cause I do have one sure. extra that I've offered to um, the society page for a project he's doing is sort of like the, the prize for that or something. And I, I need to touch base with him and see what's, what's going on with that. But yeah, it is a very important read on this. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's just so heartbreaking how cruel the Adelsons treated Ruth Markell and Phil, as well as Shelley. You know, we haven't gotten to the part about Wendy driving off without, without telling them. Mm -hmm. You know, that time Ruth thought that she was going to get to see the grandchildren again. It was the beginning of that separation, and she had no idea. I mean, she was just so... Um... Like, again, she was uh, naive to that. Understandably, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, it doesn't sound, she doesn't reference it, but it, it doesn't really sound like that she was tuned in at this stage to thinking that they were involved, you know, that she was, you know, getting any kind of cl clear picture about that other than there was strange mm -hmm. behavior here and there. Yeah, or maybe she was just too numb. Yeah. And she just still had to act like, oh, everything's okay for the sake of trying to see her grandchildren. Right. And she was still thinking at this point that um, that she was going to be grieving with Wendy. You know, that she wanted to get with Wendy to grieve together. You know, she was still thinking, you know, and, and, you know we're looking back with 2020, but... Like, I mean, it makes mm -hmm. sense that she would think that way, that like anybody who loved and cared and that was his family, you know, she was his family yeah. for so long, or especially with the kids. Ex wife. Yeah. yeah. Um, even though they mm -hmm. were having all kinds of conflict and stuff like that. I mean, she was still seeing him, seeing Wendy as part of that intimate family circle, but mm -hmm. obviously that was not the case. She learned that. On to page 19. Um Wendy's mother, Donna, when they went over to the house um, after the service, after the memorial, and she talked about how there wasn't much decoration, there weren't many toys in the living room, no kids' blankets or soft stuff. It's like Dan liked to call the boys stuffed animals. It's neat and tidy, verging on empty. I'm of the belief that Donna was very actively packing them up to, you know, when yeah. they had the ha house half packed up for the move. Uh, and I have a feeling that we will see in Donna's trial some evidence around that, that she was even before the murder, because this was the day, next day, right? So, yeah. Yeah, yeah so, that would further implicate Wendy as well, if Donna was already planning the move. Before the murder, yeah. I mean, yeah. If and, you know, she was such a planner. I mean, they they planned the Pearl Harbor thing far in advance and yes. had had that just ready to execute, you know, on the date that they, pl they planned that. I 
this is no exception. So there, there's got to be breadcrumbs. I think we're going to see that come out in Donna's trial. Okay. Mm -hmm. So she's talking about that. And, um, I'm kind of highlighted some Donna things simply because we are gearing up for Donna's trial. So, you know, to keep this in our minds, Wendy's mother, Donna greeted us warmly, but was very busy. Okay. This is page 19 at the top. Um, was very busy talking to the guests who were there. She had gone into full hostess mode, cooking, serving, and cleaning. As uncomfortable and in shock as I was, Donna's behavior appeared normal. People had dropped off meals and sweets, and Donna made no effort to respect kosher laws that we all knew were so important to Dan. Harvey, Wendy's father, said a meek hello to us, but kept moving, even though he looked as though he didn't know where to go, which is exactly how Tamara Demko described him with even more detail. Mm -hmm. um, skipping ahead to another chapter of Shelley. And I don't want to read the whole book because I want people to buy the book, you know? Yeah. Anyway, Shelley and Phil had spotted Benjamin Lincoln at the arts and crafts table adjacent to the kitchen. The boys were drawing with colored pencils. So they went over to join the children. Shelley is Dan's sister, by the way. Um, the boys were drawing with colored pencils. So they went over to join the children, helping them draw in color. Harvey also seemed lost and couldn't connect, not with the play group of Shelley, Phil, and the boys or with the other visitors. When a small group of family friends waved him over to join them, he didn't respond. I was sitting in a chair and not engaged in the play activities, still in disbelief. And then she talks about leaving and telling Wendy that she'd like to see the boys. And, um, and then things that they did you know, with the police and the university and stuff the next day, thinking that they were, she was going to see the boys the next day. It was a difficult, this is page 20. It was a difficult morning, but I got through it knowing we would soon be spending time with the boys. I called Wendy to make sure that noon was still okay. It's not, Wendy said, the boys are really busy. What are three and four year olds really busy with? Okay. I said, how about 1 PM? Not today, Ruth. Wendy said, it's not a good day. Yes. I could not believe it. What a punch to the gut. I was feeling terrible already. This was my only connection to Dan. I felt the boys needed us as well. It was summertime. Benjamin and Lincoln weren't old enough to go to school, and I couldn't imagine that they had a lot of plans. However, I figured they might be feeling emotional and unsettled, so I tried to not make a big deal out of it. The Ms. Fine part of my personality was coming out. Top of 21. Tomorrow then, I asked, trying to keep my extreme disappointment out of my voice. I mean, I can, I, I hear Ruth's voice when, when I read this, you know, and, and how composed she is. It total, it's, it's totally her. Wendy said, yes, we would speak in the morning. When I got off the phone, my daughter Shelly was furious, furious enough for the three of us. What the hell? Unbelievable, she said angrily. Those boys are just babies. Where could they be going at 12 o'clock in the afternoon? What could be so important? That was my reaction to Shelly. I agreed with her, as did Phil, but short of storming over to Wendy's house uninvited, we didn't have much choice but to wait. It was crazy and unbearable, but Phil and Shelley were having none of it. We calmed down, got back to the grim task we were busy with. After all, we would see the boys tomorrow. When I called early the next morning, Wendy said Benjamin and Lincoln were still busy, and she put them on the phone with us. I was so happy to hear their voices and excited we had connected. All I wanted to do was hold them. We expected to see them at noon and went back to the dreaded task. We returned to Dan's house to face the challenge of going through his possessions. Combing through them was unspeakably painful. And we were frustrated that after looking everywhere, we did not find Dan's will. We collected his clothes and housewares, called his close friends to ask each of them to come by and take what they wanted. I mean, this is so much to do so soon after. Then we packed up the children's toys to bring them over to Wendy's. Dan had a house full of playthings. Well, of course, she's thinking they're staying there, right? And Wendy's place looked like it needed some. Yeah, because Donna had them all like packed up and ready to go. After we had gathered up everything, I decided to try Wendy again. We found so many of Linky and Ben Ben's toys at Dan's house, I said, and we'd like to bring them over. Wendy didn't even pause. Unfortunately, you can't see them, she replied. I was so worried about their safety and mine that we left the house and drove back to Miami right after we saw you. Yeah. Yeah. Such a liar. I mean, so yeah, devious. Is, yeah. The cruelty. 
Yeah, mm -hmm. this is even more cruel than just being up front. Well, it's <laughs> so many layers of cruel. Like it's it's heartless for her not to let Ruth see the boys. It's even more cruel to lead her on like that, you know, repeatedly disappointing her. And 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 then also it just seems stupid to be alerting Ruth to the fact that Wendy is so devious and willing to lie like that, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How convenient and, that yeah. she's packed up and gone. And how you shocking. Know? Like to first of all, to just find that out that they're not going to be accessible. But like then to be putting all these things together that like, why didn't you tell me that yesterday? Why didn't you, you know, why didn't yeah. you try to work something out with me? I mean, there was, you know, now from that point, putting everything together all these years, 10 years later, is that you really see the sadism in Wendy, that she has a very sadistic streak. Even the way she left Dan was very sadistic. Like she, she mm -hmm. enjoys inflicting pain. And because Dan's dead, she has to do it. She has to inflict it somewhere and it goes to the yeah. Mark house. And, and she still has to gloat. Mm -hmm. And she's clearly not thinking about what's best for the boys um, yeah. because like that alienation from the grandparents is also traumatic for them, you know? Um, yeah. Yeah, Doris, what about the fact that Dan was protecting Wendy's ego by not mentioning Harvard at their wedding? He was so thoughtful. She was not. Yeah, I have that highlighted here somewhere. That must be, that's in the next chapter. Um, yeah, that, that was particularly surprising to me because they had, when I say they, Wendy and Donna together, had selected his profile from the dating uh, J-date because, well, you know, well, I assume like the pedigree influenced them, the, you know, Harvard and, uh, but, and I would have thought they would be proud of that. Um, so... That, that seems surprising that they weren't proud of his accomplishments. Yeah. All right. Well, we're, it's almost 830 already. We got, huh. we got a little yeah. ways to go here. Um, I'm just flew by. I know yeah. it really did fly by. Um, okay. I'm going to, I'm going to jump ahead here because um Go to the next chapter, Danny and Wendy. I'm going to kind of speed things up a little bit. We might have to do, Mia, I might have to do another um, video on your art piece because I know people have lives. <laughs> this is like going, taking time. So let's jump ahead to the Danny and Wendy chapter. Um, and this is really, there's there's a really profound part of this. And, and Ruth really wanted me to highlight Dan as a person to everybody. So I'm going to do that here. We're on page 32 toward the bottom. And it's starting with Dan knew that everyone loved him. I love that sentence. Part of my job with this book is to put the picture back together to claim what is right to claim my rights as the mother of a slain son and what is right for Dan, who dedicated his career in law essentially to making things right. That's a very powerful sentence. Dan was an ambitious boy. We moved from Montreal to Toronto when he was five years old. He left Toronto at the age of 18 to attend Harvard University and never returned. He received his undergraduate degree from Harvard and continued his studies at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, then moved to England where he earned a master's degree in political theory from Emmanuel College, Cambridge in 1997. He returned to Harvard for law school and graduated in 2001. He became a law clerk to senior judge Michael Daly Hawkins, United States Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit. Dan had a passion for travel and lived in many cities, including Montreal, Toronto, Boston, London, Jerusalem, New York, Phoenix, San Francisco, Miami, Tallahassee, and Washington, D.C. A lot of places to live before you're 40. And he was in Phoenix when I was there. Um. Dan's first full-time job was an associate with the law firm Kellogg, Huber, Hanson, Todd, Evans, and Feigl in Washington, D.C., a firm excelling in litigation, including commercial, appellate, and intellectual property. And then it goes on to how they met on J-Date and the Prof's blog and that sort of thing. 
Um, I found this interesting on the next page on 34. Between Dan and Wendy, issues in the marriage were evident from the start, even before the start. The Thursday prior to Dan and Wendy's wedding in 2006, Dan came to, to Miami where Phil and I were staying at my uncle Laser's condo in North Miami Beach. That's kind of ironic. We went out on the balcony facing the ocean and had a long talk, and he asked us not to mention that he went to Harvard, just what you were saying, Allison. At, at the parties we were about to attend prior to the wedding. Why, we asked. Dan said he did not want Wendy to feel inferior around his friends. We never spoke of Harvard at these parties. Phil and I chose to be silent at the large gathering on the Saturday night before the wedding where there were many toasts and speeches. And I think Dan must have also spoken to close friends about that issue, guiding them to avoid much talk about his accomplishments. There were few toasts for him, but many for Wendy. Yeah, that's so weird. It's like, why, why wouldn't they be proud of Dan? And why wouldn't she want people to know about what a superstar her husband was. I mean, it, and it seems like Donna would be wrapped up in that, but you think that Donna would be wanting to showcase his accomplishments at least, but sounds like it struck such a nerve in Wendy. I mean, very early on, she was competing with him and she knew that she was losing, <laughs> you know, I mean, she was never going to catch up, you know, to where yeah. he but it's, yeah, you're right, Mona. That is such a warning bell. Yeah. And the whole thing with the kosher, the food not being kosher. And the yes. Wedding, that's another oh. big warning. That was huge. Yeah. That was yeah. particularly ironic because they were estranged. Donna was estranged from one son because he married a woman who wasn't Jewish. And then <laughs> she resented her Dan being like too Jewish. Mm -hmm. Right. Exactly. Like you, yeah. you're either you had to be Jewish, but not too Jewish. You know, <laughs> you had to be Jewish, but in the way that they're Jewish, which isn't really very Jewish, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I say that the Adelsons were Jewish for the parties and that's about it. Mm -hmm. uh, Joyce is asking you to read the bottom of page 33. Oh, okay. That's pretty telling. Oh, Donna, Wendy's mother was not pleased that Dan left a very established firm in DC to pursue an academic career. It was well known that the prestige and earning in this boutique firm were bigger than in academia. Is that the part? Yeah. Yeah, well, it speaks to how Donna was like completely all, all up into business. Yeah, and cared so much about money. Yeah. yeah. So one yeah. thing that was, oh, Allison, were you saying something? Oh, I was just, um, that's also consistent with the idea that despite already being financially comfortable, they were greedy for more. You know, they, they still wanted Dan's, uh, life insurance and, you know, the financial motive, I think, was part of it. You think, well, it wouldn't be because they had plenty of money, but uh, I think that indicates that having even more money was important to Donna. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And there was never going to be enough. I mean, mm -hmm. it's evidenced by her, like, wanting Wendy to get with that Dave and all that stuff. Okay, going jumping over to 36 at the bottom. This is, this is interesting because it's about the, her book. Although Wendy never said it out loud to me, there was resentment. In 2011, Wendy published a novel titled, This is Our Story, a thinly veiled account of her marriage, as well as her fight against human trafficking. Wendy's depiction of her fictional character, Lily's marriage, mirrored what we would later learn were her feelings in her own. Her fictional Lily felt trapped in a small Florida panhandle town while her, while her bumble-prone professor husband, Josh, see, she's got to be putting him down, um, brought little excitement to her life. Ultimately, Lily left her husband along with their child shortly after the publication of her book, Wendy Did the Same. And also, I think there was a thing about making sure that the child had her last name and just exactly what Wendy yeah. did. Just Wendy often stated, this is an important thing um, that is often mis, 
spoken about. Wendy often stated that Dan never read her book. Recently, I learned from one of Dan's close friends that he did read Wendy's book. And despite his awareness of her depiction of his character in the story, Dan even promoted it heavily throughout his circles, including to readers of his popular blog, Prof's blog. Nevertheless, Wendy maintained that Dan had ignored her work. She's still mm -hmm. saying that to that day, this day, yeah. but friends of Dan has said that he did read her book. But I mean, the mm -hmm. audacity, she's writing a book that's clearly about him and disparaging him and talking about how unhappy and she's still married to him. You know, it's not like they're divorced yet. And she's complaining that he's not like all excited about this work that is sort of trashing him, you know, this book. Like the, the narcissism is just so off the charts mm -hmm. here. Yeah. Plus the book is terrible. So... Yeah, yeah I, I mean, did you you read it, didn't you, Judy? Yeah, I read it. I still have my copy here. You, you took it for the team. Yeah. Um, okay. I haven't Jeff read it, but there was a passage that was read on another podcast um, where Wendy described telling. Sorry, of course it's she has another name for the but Lily. <laughs> Lily um, tells her husband that she's leaving him. And she said that she couldn't help but also laugh at him. Oh. Yeah, I don't remember that, but she definitely had a condescending view. Exactly. As if she's all that. Mia Wallace says, can you imagine the esteemed legal minds and intelligent professionals on Prof's blog reading Wendy's dim-witted nonsense and that horrible excuse for a book? Yeah. Very funny. How did she get to be required text at for was it for undergrads at or the, incoming freshmen yeah at FSU. must have been connections you know having yeah. friends in high places as usual because she yeah. taught at fsu my sympathies judy oh, thank you robin <laughs> side barbie i hate to admit i want to read it but i refuse to give that woman a cent of my money well, it'll probably show up somewhere for five cents on some. Oh, it's actually eBay. pretty expensive on eBay. Last Is I it? checked, it was like 50 something dollars. So I got mine used for maybe 12 to 14. Wow, um, that's still pretty expensive for a crappy book. Yeah, piece of crap. Yeah. Jade says, we always hear that Wendy's non-confrontational, but writing this passive aggressive book is very bold. It is. Yeah. Um, okay, let's move over to, um, cause I wanted to read this part on 37, um, Phil and, Phil and I, well, cracks in Dan and Wendy's marriage started becoming more obvious to us by 2011. Dan was away in Israel for most of the month in December. As soon as he left, Dan learned that Donna fed the boys shrimp and pork to obviously non-kosher foods. Yeah, the food was a big deal. Phil and I arrived in Florida soon after that for the December vacation. One day we met Donna and Harvey for brunch with Dan, Wendy, and the boys. The mood was tense. Dan and Wendy left early to give the boys their afternoon nap. Dan also seemed anxious and said he'd had an upset stomach. Once Phil and I were alone with Donna and Harvey, Donna zeroed in on me. Why is Dan more observant than anyone else in your family? She grilled. I mean, what a bitch. I mean, anyway. Um, it wasn't the first time I explained again that Shelly, it's like, she's a bully to Ruth. I, I explained again that Shelly and her family have a kosher home as well. Donna remained frustrated about the Jewish dietary pr practices and she's a Jew. The interference that Dan perceived became increasingly troublesome to him. Dan told me that Donna's involvement was too much for him, especially after the birth of Lincoln, their second child, but I felt it wasn't my place to intervene. Yeah, I could see, um, where that is a very conflicting place for Ruth to be in. Like, you know, you want your son's marriage to work out. You want the family to be held together. You hope that they're going to work it out. Dan seemed very motivated to have it work out. And you have no idea that there's this toxic worm, you know, moving through the whole thing that's uh, hell bent on destroying it. Um. 
over to 39, um, just sort of jumping ahead, it turns out that Wendy, Donna, and maybe others used this time to orchestrate the marriage's separation. They were acting together, planning Wendy's extraction from the marriage behind Dan's back, while Wendy kept up a ruse of working on their relationship. I think that's really, really telling because it's exactly what they did with the murder. Yes. That's They're all together. Just yep. I think They're a team. Fine. They're planning it well in advance. And like I said, you know, there's probably evidence that we'll see in Donna's trial that wasn't applicable in other trials because it's directly relates to Donna that, that speaks to her efforts at planning before the murder even happened. Yeah. Definitely. I found at the bottom of that page, I put a little star next to this about how he didn't, this is when she left Pearl, the Pearl Harbor. Um, and we know that story. He didn't realize that she'd already left, taken the children and their belongings and emptied more than half the house, including the ketchup in the fridge. Wow. <laughs> so cheap. I know. I could see Donna grabbing that like, okay, we're going to, first thing we're going to do is have hot dogs. No, yeah, not the ketchup. Hot dogs and we need ketchup for our nunk. Woo, we're alone. We can now have nunk food. Yahoo. I, I think I remember Dan's legal pleading or court filing said that Wendy had also taken all the paper towels or maybe even toilet paper in the house. Something something that made it seem so petty and mean spirited and took his tennis racket and buy oh, was a ten, tennis racket, I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's like, why did you have to do that? It's clearly his tennis racket. You know, why not leave a roll of paper towels? She could have just that same, like, I'm going to stick it to you, going to stick it to you, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. It probably yeah. delighted her to do yeah. all that. Her true crime wife, he says, meanwhile, Wendy was attending parenting classes to satisfy the family court requirements before she even filed for divorce. Yeah. Yeah. So she was right. yeah, getting the um, getting her ducks in a row. So let's jump ahead to page 43, which is exactly Dan's motion to the marital settlement agreement about the um, Donna bad mouthing him and all that. Cause we know all this stuff about Donna and her crazy emails and all that kind of stuff. We need, need to go over all that again, baptized in the Catholic church and all that nonsense. So, but I found this interesting that Dan's the marital settlement agreement dated July 30th, 2013 discussed very various parenting provisions made clear that no such disparagement or alienation would be acceptable. Interesting. The word alienation Dan's motion included reference to this, stating Section 2.1e of the MSA, which is the Marital Settlement Agreement, requires in pertinent part that neither party shall at any time disparage, criticize, belittle, or otherwise ridicule the other parent in the presence of the minor children. Each party shall instruct the children to love and respect the other parent and shall promote a loving and caring feeling for the other parent. Um, each party shall encourage a feeling of affection between the minor children and the other party. Neither party shall do anything to hamper the natural development of the minor children's love and respect for the other party. I mean, how sad that that has to be an illegal filing, but he knew who he was dealing with at that point. And then um, going on to the next page on 44, the Lincoln further stated to, um, Oh, okay. This is part of the part of the thing it's stated to Mr. Markell in front of the former life. Ah, but grandma says she hates you. We've heard that the children were sitting with their grandparents at that time. And then that the children have heard this is because this is pertinent to Donna's trial that the children have heard disparaging statements from their maternal grandmother about their father is especially concerning in light of the fact that as I mentioned above, the former wife leaves the children unsupervised with her parents in violation of the court ordered right of first refusal she was supposed to call Dan to give him the chance to be with the children prior to hiring a babysitter or even her parents. And she had not always done so. Mr. Markell is concerned that continued exposure to such negativity forms the foundation for parental alienation, which is exactly what they did. Mr. Markell is puzzled by the maternal grandmother's behavior as he has always been supportive of the children's relationship with the maternal grandparents. Regardless of the rationale, the maternal grandmother's dislike of Mr. Markell must not be displayed in the presence of the children. So, yeah. And then, you know, of course we all know that Wendy lied on the stand saying that um, 
she didn't think her mother knew about that filing. And in reality, she had forwarded her the email. Yeah. In there. Which that was a good good moment when Georgia pointed that out that you yeah, emailed it to 12 great. different people. Do you think they've saying. continued to disparage Dan to the boys? After he died? Yeah. Probably. Yeah. I think I, mean, so. I, I don't think Donna could control that. And if nobody's policing her, then why not? You know, these are some pictures that when you buy the book, you will get these pictures. Um, I'm just going to hold them up so you can see some of Ruth's personal pictures. This one she sent me, and for some reason it disappeared off that. I'll put it on my channel later. I don't know why it's not there because I uploaded it this morning. But anyway, those are just some pictures. Um, so now we're going to move on to, let me just look at comments here. So I'm kind of moving a little faster, guys. So if I'm missing your comment, it's not personal. It's just that I'm, I'm aware of the clock. Um, Wendy testified the Mercos have had unfettered access to Dan's boys. Yeah, right. It's crazy. Yeah, she's such a liar. Donna has trashed the boys to Dan for the last 10 years. No doubt about it. Yeah. I don't know how you see pictures on the audible JJ Don. I don't know if you can, I don't know if that's, I've never like done an audible where I'm just not listening to it in my car. Um, Dan put that in the MSA because he knew that's exactly what the Adelsons were going to do from, the, from the get go. Yeah. Every time it happens, I'm shocked. The obvious hatred each of the Markells still have for Dan. I catch my breath every time I see it. Yeah. I mean, even sense. Wendy couldn't even testify without making a snarky comment about Ruth in the courtroom. It's just, it's just, it's just evil. That's the only word. Okay. Well, let's move along to the next chapter, which um, Allison is going to be. Um, Sorry, just from the. Um, do this. Leading us through. Let me see how I do this. There we go. There you are. Okay. So where would you like to start, Allison, on the grief chapter? Um, I was going to start with her discussion about how her grief didn't conform to the stereotypical model of grief, which is something that I really identified with myself. Mm -hmm. um, so she writes, there is a famous Kubler-Ross model of grief after the passing of a loved one, which has it coming in emotional stages. First denial, then anger, then bargaining, then depression, and finally acceptance. In my experience, grief has been nothing like this. Closure does not exist when a death mingles with an unending trial and a life turned over to law enforcement and lawyers. Before Dan's death, I was a content person. I look at that person now and see how lucky she was. In all this, there is no normalcy. In my case, experts might agree I suffer from what is commonly known as complicated grief. Complicated grief can manifest as an ongoing inability to experience normal grief reactions. It can also come out as delayed grief or chronic grief. Usually complicated grief is associated with cases in which the death is sudden and the relationship with the deceased was close. Mm. I, rec I recently learned that in the Jewish tradition, we have a distinction between mourning and grieving. Grief is this a is age 57, by the way, people go ahead. Okay, sure. Uh, grief is a feeling. All people feel a loss. Mourning, on the other hand, is its own religious category, complete with rituals and responsibility. Before Dan died, I was already familiar with many of these rituals, including cemetery visits, candle lighting, and prayer, due to the early death of my father. From my childhood, the day of, I think it's pronounced, um, uh, Yartzeit, 
a Memorial Day for the death of an immediate relative observed on the anniversary of the death and iconic for the special long lasting candles lit in honor was an annual practice. The art site can also be marked by going to the synagogue or making a donation. It has been described by scholar Morris Lamb as a tradition that is commemorative of both the enormous tragedy of death and the abiding glory of the parental heritage. Lamb adds, it is a day when one relives the moment of doom. It is a day conditioned by the need to honor one's parents in death as in life. I'm not the most observant Jew, but the traditions relating to death and the cemetery have become over the years, a huge part of my identity as a Jew and a woman. They have been a comfort to me, especially at family gatherings and where the emptiness, sorry, let me read that again. They've become a comfort to me, especially at family gatherings where the emptiness I feel from the loss of Dan is there even more than usual. And the usual, that's not easy either. In my day-to-day -day life, people often ask, how many children do you have? I answer by saying, I have five grandchildren, three in Canada and two in the United States. For most people, that is enough. In very select situations, such as medical assessments, I will share about having lost my son to explain causes of stress. Usually, I wait until the appointment is over to let the person treating me know that my son was murdered, because it's always shocking to everyone. Even today, seven years later, I'm still often asked impossible questions. What was it like when you got the news? How often do you still cry over Danny? What keeps you from just curling up in a fetal position and never getting out of bed? At first, I was a bit puzzled by my coping mechanisms. Numbness over crying, a feeling of being outside of my body over weeping. I thought something was wrong with me. I have since learned that there is neither a right or wrong way to grieve, nor a right or wrong way to feel. You have to find your own path through the ups and downs and hope that your personal ability to cope will bring you strength and as close as possible to peace. I highlighted that last chapter too that you read. I think that's a really, I mean, it, if that's a huge takeaway from this whole book for me. about yeah. the grieving process. What about that really struck with you, Allison? Um, uh, well, several things. Um, mm -hmm. uh, as, as a kid, especially, I dreaded the typical introductory questions about family um, because I felt like a misfit not only for being motherless, but also for the way my mother had died. And so I tried to steer conversations away from the topic and reveal as little as possible without quite lying. And that, you know, sometimes led to misunderstandings that I didn't correct. Um, I remember being asked things like, um, well, quite often like, oh, does your mother work? And then I, you know, say no. And they say, oh, how nice for you to have your mother at home. Um, or like, how many cabbage cabbage patch dolls did your mom buy for you and then i would answer just reminding me of ruth like oh i have four cabbage patch dolls and then you know <laughs> say like wow you're lucky um mm -hmm. uh and uh you know the kind that kind of disingenuousness felt deceitful but uh it was also better than the shock and invariable Easy, uneasy silence. Um, yeah. I can relate to everything you're saying, having lost my mother so young too, and just wanting to fit in in school and just at the same time being in class and being just tortured by hearing my schoolmates make comments about their mom making their lunch or, you know, bringing in cupcakes for, for the class or, any, you know, and none of that was happening and just being desperate. I remember asking my grandma who lived with us, is it okay if I call you mommy? You know, just oh. wanting that spot filled in my life was so difficult. So I, I relate to that too. Yeah. I would um, love to hear Allison's story. 
mm -hmm. maybe in, a, in another live stream. Yeah, we'll do another one and, and dive into that more um, to Allison. But it just goes to show you how important a book like this is when it talks about universal grief and principles of that and, and how there's no, you know, real right or wrong way and how you, you know, have to navigate things that you didn't expect you would. Like people ask me, how many siblings do you have? Well, how do I say that? You know, I grew up with two and now I have one. And I think about my brother, you know, my brother has a mental illness and I've been with him in appointments where he's being evaluated for his mental health. And he's being asked, you know, have you had any, you know, major life events? And he will not even bring up the murder of my sister. Like, I mean, and that's when he went off the rails with his schizophrenia was at the trial and he won't even bring it up. And I mean, I have, I feel like these professionals have to know, you know, he has navigated this very, very traumatic event that was the catalyst for everything happening. So, you know, it's just, it's awkward. And, you know, I, I totally get what she's saying there too, about you dread those kind of questions because you just don't, I mean, I, I've said to people, well, I did have two and now I have one, but now you've opened a whole can of worms. <laughs> you know, and it's not necessary, you know. Um, and then I can definitely relate to my grief process not conforming to that stereotypical model. Um, you know, as I mentioned, the my grief almost lay dormant for over two decades. And, um, but... At the same time, I think that emotionally I was kind of stunted <laughs> um, at the age of five. And, um, uh, but it wasn't until I was pregnant um, and, you know, then had my first child um, that I longed for my mom. Um, and it was too powerful to suppress. Um, and I felt a renewed connection to her. Um, I think that another thing that was hard, which I worry about Dan's boys, um, is uh, my father like all forbade me, all but forbade me to talk about my mom or ask about my mom. And, you know, he disparaged her saying that, oh, it was probably a serial killer that kills prostitutes that killed her because she was acting like a prostitute. And, oh, if you had, if she'd um, uh, stayed alive, you would become a drug addict because she was taking drugs. And, um, you know, later I asked him, like, what kind of drugs? And he was like, oh, I don't know. <laughs> you know, and uh, uh, yeah, he was just, he was just making these things up. I, I look forward to under diving more into your your case and and understanding that more because it sounds like it was really extremely long term tra trauma for you and very heartbreaking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you know, I mean, grief is grief, and then there's homicide. <laughs> you know, and Ruth talks about that, and the, that that just takes things into a whole other realm um, of complication. Um, I had a few more passages from this grief chapter that um, I'm going to kind of skip over some things, but, um, oh, this was interesting. A GoFundMe page was started by Dan's friend. Most people know this Tamara Demko to get some immediate donations. We're so appreciate appreciative to Dan's family and friends for their considerations. The proceeds of the fund were later put in trust for Benjamin and Lincoln. Wendy had tried to attain the GoFundMe donations directly, claiming to be Dan's widow, which added further grief and drama to the process. And then on in that vein, one major discussion, this was on chapter, I mean, page 60, and this is on 61. One major discussion involved Wendy directly. Wendy requested upkeep funds for expenses such as rent and food from the boys' trust because Shelley became the administrator of all the finances and still is. As I mentioned before, there were numerous other sources of funds, such as the pension and investments through the university. And as we now know, she had an account with half a million dollars in it um, under Donna's 
umbrella. Wendy was also receiving $2,400 per month for each child from government social security because their father was deceased. Wendy was also entitled to take over the ownership of the house on Trescott where Dan lived. But almost symbolically, a few months after Dan's death, a tree fell on the roof causing major damage. There were just so many complications and issues concerning money began creating tensions between us and Wendy. Everyone walked on eggshells. She had plenty of money, but she was still grabbing, getting her sticky fingers on anything that she could. And taking it from her boys. I mean, the, the trust is for them. And she wants to pay her rent out of it. Yeah. And I mean, she had plenty of money. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Right. I want to just... Oh, Judy, did you were saying something? Oh, no, just agreeing with you guys. Okay. Yeah. Um, I want to just kind of finish on the um, unveiling, the whole concept of the unveiling, which is the, it has many meanings to Ruth in titling this book that, but in the Jewish tradition, the unveiling, and it was very profound time for her. And so that's on 64. And I wanted to sort of highlight that. Um, in the Jewish tradition, there is the unveiling. Once a Jewish tombstone is placed, there is a specific service for removing a cloth covering it. I called this book the unveiling, not only because of the unveiling of Dan's tombstone was the most difficult moment for me after the murder, but also because the removal of the cloth symbolizes what I want to show, the real story that goes on behind the scenes and behind the headlines for families who are victims of crime and violence. Like the lifting, like the act of lifting the fabric that reveals the writing carved into the tombstone, this book will expose what it feels like to be living the trial life. I thought this was very profound. But what it was the tombstone that would not let me forget that Dan was gone forever. I visited Rabbi Aaron at the Beth Shalom Synagogue in Toronto. I asked her today how to pronounce his last name, and she said, just call him Rabbi Aaron. That's what everybody calls him. Um, Shelley and her family are members there and attend frequently. Rabbi Aaron, as he's known, is officiated at the funeral, has been very supportive of me. Phil and I already selected the cemetery plots before the Toronto funeral back in July 2014. At our synagogue, the Beth Emeth, Pearl Grundlin, the executive director, treated us with great compassion, as did the Beth Emeth leadership. We now face the unveiling and we had to choose the tombstone. Phil and I chose one together. We explored several monuments before deciding on a light brown granite stone. For my family, the tombstone inscription was something we approached with great focus, like a work of art. We needed to figure out what to say, but also wanted to write something that really reflected Dan. Common inscri inscriptions such as loving father, son, brother, and friend always cherished were not enough. We went through numerous drafts and consultations with friends and the monument designer. We wanted to get so much on the stone that we needed to make sure there was room. Our final inscription reads as follows. In loving memory of Daniel Eric Markell, beloved father, son, brother, and friend, October 9th, 1972 to July 19th, 2014, his children were his world, his family, friends, and community, his pillars, his academic work, his passion, his light above so bright that it will never be extinguished. Nothing could have prepared me for the emotions I experienced prior to the unveiling. The reality of planning for this moment was difficult. I was no longer in a haze like I was during the funeral. The weeks prior to the unveiling were my deepest feelings of sadness. I was not numb. Selecting the actual tombstone brought me out of my out-of-body experience. And that's the way it happens. It's sort of like you kind of freeze to get through things and then, then it hits you. And then I just wanted to finish, um, well, this chapter, and then I want to finish with the poem. I felt terribly sad and full of pain as my wound was reopened. It was April 16th, 2015. The ceremony of the tombstone began with Shelley's eldest, my granddaughter, Michael, beautifully singing the song of Eli, Eli, based on the poem written by Hannah Sainz, a Hungarian Jewish resistance fighter. Shelley spoke many meaningful words, shared memories of Dan, and thanked everyone for keeping Dan's memory alive. There was a huge turnout. The rabbi spoke and we unveiled the stone. 
When it happened, my pain felt almost insurmountable. I never wanted to return to that place again, and yet I never wanted to leave because leaving would mean leaving Dan forever. All of my memories of Dan's life came back from childhood to adulthood. Each person present reminded me of another period of his life and another and another. It was unbearably sad. It's interesting that, you know, a year later, it's really, um, you know, she's thawing enough to those feelings to start to come up. And then we're going to end on this note, page 68. Many of the guests were pale and flushed with lots of tears and tissues as we shared a common sorrow. As I stood between all these people, I thought of the beautiful poem read by Rabbi Aaron at the grave site, trying to take its words to heart. Do not stand by my grave and weep. I am not there. I do not sleep. I am the thousand winds that blow. I am the diamond glints in snow. I am the sunlight on ripened grain. I am the gentle autumn rain. As you awake with morning's hush, I am the swift upflinging rush of quiet birds in circling flight. I am the day transcending night. Do not stand by my grave and cry. I am not there. I did not die. And that is a picture of Dan's. Let me see if I'm getting that in there. Let me, let me make this on the this whole thing. Let me hide this comment. And I don't know how to get myself on here. So I can put this, oh, here, here we go. So you can see this, there is the picture of Dan's yes, gravestone with all the stones sitting on top of it, which is also a Jewish tradition that I read in the book about placing a small stone on top of the headstone. So there it is. Mia, we're going to do, I'm going to do your picture in a separate um, video because I think that's a good place to conclude this on that note of that poem. Let me bring these beautiful ladies back on here. Here we go. There we are. Oh, here's a, do you want to meet another beautiful lady? This is my oldest daughter. Yes, we do. Sarah. Hi, Sarah. Sarah. Hi. Thanks for joining us. Yeah. <laughs> How old are you, Sarah? I'm 17. Oh, you're 17. Oh, you're a beautiful, beautiful teenager. Nice to meet you, sweetie. Nice to meet you too. I know yeah. um, my mom, my mom's always talking about you and she'll <laughs> show us your like live streams and be like, oh, look, like. <laughs> Aww, so, so we already know each other. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Awesome. I was last yeah. night showing her um, John's explanation about uh, in, in the car explaining, uh, Donna's without borders and, oh, and yeah. she had to go to an extradition <laughs> country. My to husband's crazy. <laughs> He's a crazy psychologist. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You'll have to get him to do another one. We haven't taken a drive in a while. It's how we entertain ourselves in the car. Yeah. Everybody's saying cool. hello to Sarah. She's a beautiful young lady, beautiful, sweet girl. You are lovely. Yeah. Yeah, life goes on, right? Yeah. All right. Well, let's see if there's any other final remarks, mm -hmm. any comments that you'd like to share for Ruth. Um, oh, that poem is read in um, Four Weddings and a Funeral. That must be at the uh, funeral of that, um, I don't know, that one guy. <laughs> All right. What a great addition to close out the stream. Yeah, hug them when we can. Hi, Sarah. All right. There's, yeah, I'll, I'll pull some of these questions for her for another time. Thank you so much for doing this book club and to Judy and Allison, and most of all to Ruth and to Dan. He's an eternal professor still teaching. That's a beautiful thing to say, Margie. That is a that is a very beautiful note to end this on. Thank you, Katie, Judy, and Allison for this enlightening and heartfelt reading. Love to Ruth and the family. Anything, Allison or Judy, you want to conclude with? Um, oh, thank you, Kathy, for having this great idea for us yeah. to focus on Ruth's book. Well, thank you for joining me, everybody. Yeah. You guys um, and everybody. Yeah, 
filled with gratitude to um, to you, Kathy, for sharing so much of yourself, and to Judy for covering the case uh, for such a long time, and um, uh, yeah, and to Ruth for writing such an extraordinary book um, that I found really helps me um, in how vulnerable yet how strong you know she's been. Yeah, that's a really good way to put that. Yeah, she is a blessing. And, and you know, we'll find ways to support her in Tallahassee, you know, and maybe be thinking of that. You know, one thing that she said there is on the on the yard site is, you know, making a donation or something in Dan's name or something like that. You know, we'll keep those suggestions going. <laughs> so, And yeah. I know the boys will um, eventually read her book and you know, appreciate how much love she has for them. I believe so too. It's a gift she's leaving to them. And as well as Phil's, you know, impact statement that he read and John Steinbeck had him re reading that online. They'll find this stuff eventually. And we will, we will explore some of that more when we do a, we'll talk about doing that um, in the future, Allison, kind of your trajectory of that. So people maybe can understand what it's like to be a child and navigating that and, Maybe have a you know a, a template because um, there's a lot of questions around that. Mm -hmm. Okay, everybody. Well, I think um, I think we're gonna call it an evening. I for one feel kind of exhausted now. Yeah, emotional. I can't believe it's over two hours now. <laughs> I know it goes fast, doesn't it? it does. Every time I'm with you, you Judy, everything goes so fast. Yeah. Like, all of a sudden, there's, yeah. there's so much to talk about. Yeah. All right, everybody. Well, thank you for coming out tonight and joining us. We have two more of these left. So stay tuned. Come, well, you know, we're going to inch our way through the book and uh, we'll be covering it next. And um, maybe what well, I don't think, Judy, you're going to be able to come to the next one, right? You have something. Yeah. Ne yeah. Next week, I'm going to Montreal, which is oh, where Markel was born. <laughs> yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. Well, maybe I can talk to Allison about joining me again because it's nice to have other voices here. Definitely. That would be an honor. Thank you. Okay, great. All right, well, we'll make it a thing. And I need to reach okay. out to Susan. All right, guys. Well, let's say good night and thank you so much for joining us and uh, take care, everybody. Thank you. Bye, take care, everybody. Bye-bye.